Good morning and welcome to our service this Sunday morning, February 11th, 2024. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and join me as we say our opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come into your house to worship, many times we fail to realize you're always present. You're always there with us. We allow our cares, our concerns, our worries to distract us. Many times our everyday life seems so busy we figure you're not able to oversee what's happening. Like Adam and Eve, sometimes we figure we can hide from you and that you don't know what's going on in our lives. Scripture tells us you're all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present. We ask you to be with us during this time of worship. We ask you to guide and direct everything we say and do. Be with all those who will be involved in today's service. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our call to worship is going to be on the overhead, and I'll ask you to join me as we read this. Come, listen to the words of the Lord. Help us receive his word and direction for our lives. Proclaim the goodness of God's love. Come, now is the time to worship. Open our eyes, our hearts, and our spirits to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Our gathering song is Jesus Stand Amongst Us. We're going to be singing verses 1 and 2. As always, when I lead, I like to stand as we sing. So if you can stand, I'll encourage you to do so. If you're not able to, that's fine. seated. We'd like to once again welcome everybody, especially those who are worshiping in person with us here, as well as those who are joining us online and those who might be viewing it at a later time. We hope this service will be a blessing to all. The announcements, Bible study, you'll see we're doing it Wednesday at 7 p.m., but because this Sunday or this Wednesday is a Ash Wednesday holiday, it's actually going to take place at Thursday at the 7 p.m. The Chosen, also in Bible study, this is going to be starting back our in-person Bible study. We're going to be meeting here in the sanctuary on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. The first one is scheduled the last Tuesday of this month. I can't remember the date. I thought I had it written down, but I don't see it. But we'll be meeting in person between 10 and 11 a.m. here in the church. We've had a lot of people who are interested in joining us in Bible study, but didn't want to do it via the Zoom platform. 
So we're going to be able to have both of those platforms available now. Sorry. So we'll have both of those platforms available. If you'd like to join us on the uh, Wednesday, which this week will be the Thursday, we're going to be continuing on the Apostles' Creed. And Reverend Donovan is actually going to be leading the one that's starting the end of the month. Uh, and that's going to be on the topic of the chosen. We don't know what he's chosen for it, but we'll find out if you come and join us. So it's not going to be the same topic. So if you want to, you can join us in both of them. Or if you'd like to choose one or the other, feel free to join us. Reminder, this coming Wednesday, the 14th, is the Ash Wednesday service. It takes place in the early morning, starting at 6.30 to 9 a.m. at the Prospect Youth Center. And you'll see there, it's going to be a time for per, uh, personal reflection. They're going to have communion and hopefully a fellowship meal afterward. So it will be roughly a two and a half hour service. You're encouraged if you'd like to join us. Last year, I think they had quite a few people, but more can always fit on the beach there. This refers to the search and call for our new RDGS. Reverend Yvette had retired and resigned. She'll be leaving at the end of February, so the search is ongoing. If you know anyone that you think would be a suitable candidate for this position, please speak to us and let us know, and we can forward it to the necessary people. But anyone that you have within the United Church that you know of, it doesn't have to be from our congregation, but throughout the United Church. So if you can think of anyone that would be appropriate, please forward the information to us. Birthdays. The only thing listed on it is one birthday, and Megan's not with us today, but Megan Gray celebrates today or not today, on the 15th, which is Thursday. Anyone else have a birthday this week? Ah, another one on the 15th. I can't remember your name again. Okay. Well, we're, we're going to sing happy birthday for you as well, and you're here, so we get to sing directly to you today. Any anniversaries that we don't know about? For some reason, we don't seem to have anniversaries this time of the year, but we're going to sing the happy birthday now. Oh, that young man has an anniversary? <laughs> okay. Mr. Brad? worship the king and in a short chorus all over the world if you can stand once again I encourage you to stand
You may be seated. Let us turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, King of Kings, Lord of Lord, Maker and Creator of the universe, our Lord and our Savior, we come together today to praise you, to adore you, to worship you. We thank you for all you do for us. You've created a land rich in natural resources. Many times we fail to protect what you've entrusted to us. And we know not everybody is blessed the same. Help us to always have hearts of gratitude, to appreciate what you've given us and entrusted to us. Help us to be good stewards of what you've entrusted to us to not unnecessarily destroy the world you've created, to pollute the waters we so desperately need, to destroy the land itself. Help us to recognize that there's enough for everyone and you've provided an abundance. Help us to have hearts of compassion, hearts of love. And where we see we can help out, help us to be willing givers, sharing of what we have that was given by you to us. And today, as we celebrate our Sunday service, we come in the name of your son, Jesus, who came to us thousands of years ago in the form of a little baby. He came to live amongst us, to teach us, to preach and heal others. He came as a living example of how we should live our lives. Help us to model our lives after him and try to live up to his expectations. But most importantly, we celebrate the reason he came to this earth. He came as a means of redemption and salvation. He allowed himself to suffer and die, to be buried and rose again that we may have forgiveness of sin. At this time, dear Lord, we look on our lives and recognize we have sinned. So often we sin and repeat that same sin over and over. Sometimes it's a sin of omission where we fail to act in manners that we should have acted. We fail to speak out over injustices over oppression, over abuse, things that we could take a part in helping to eliminate or stop. We thank you that you are a loving God, and we thank you for Jesus, his sacrifice, and the redemption of sin it brings to all who believe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hear these words of assurance. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call him on him while he is near. Let the wicked forgive, forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him to the Lord and be, sorry, I didn't put on my glasses and I'm struggling to read. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he is freely pardoned. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Our children's song today is All Things Bright and Beautiful. This is a celebration of the creation Jesus had and what he's done in his creation, the beauties of the earth. Can we once again stand? And as we finish this, we'll allow the children to head upstairs for Sunday school.
You may be seated, and our children can go ahead to Sunday school at this time. It's time for our scripture reading, and Janet will be bringing us the reading today. Good morning. morning. Scripture reading today is taken from John chapter 18, verses 28 to 40, and uh, chapter 19, verses 1 to 16. Jesus before Pilate. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die, would be fulfilled. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the (coughs) Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, (coughs) You are right to say I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. Jesus sentenced to be crucified. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law, and according to that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. Sorry, sat down. Sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. 
Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. I forgot to mention earlier, you notice Reverend Donovan isn't with us. He's actually traveling right now and will be gone till the 12th. Uh, But in his place today is our guest speaker, and I forgot to mention Alan, but Alan Turner, one of our members, is going to be bringing the message. Uh, Could we please stand and sing our song of preparation, number 50, Be Still. Maybe giving me a, giving you all a bit of a hint to, to continue singing. So uh, uh, glad to be here this morning, and sorry to everyone who expected Reverend Donovan to be here this morning. Uh, unfortunately, you've got me this morning, and I'll do my best. Uh, I'm wearing my long sleeve shirt, my long trousers, so it's a special day for me as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Shall we just begin with a short word of prayer? Dear Lord, we thank you for this time to meet together to study your word and we pray that you would guide and direct us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll have to take my glasses off so I can see what I've written down here. It means I can't see you as well, but it's either seeing you or seeing what I've got down here, so... Uh, Here we are. Uh, Now most people uh, here this morning will have some knowledge about Pontius Pilate. I really can't remember when I first heard the name of Pontius Pilate. But I think it must have been in Sunday school because it's such a distant memory. I can't remember the first time I heard about him. I was certainly very young. And he's one of these characters in the New Testament, in the life of Jesus, I was always aware of. And I expect many people here as well were also always aware of Pontius Pilate in the background as Jesus came to the end of his life. And in my memory, he was always side by side with Judas Iscariot, uh, who betrayed Jesus And Judas and Pilate are two individuals I certainly associate with the betrayal 
and the death of Jesus. And I want us to look this morning at this uh, passage a little bit more closely and the events that we read about under three different uh, topics or headings. Firstly, I want us to consider who was actually pulling the strings when Pilate was engaged with Jesus, what was really going on in the background. Then secondly, what can we learn about Pilate from his history before he became famous through his involvement with Jesus and his crucifixion? And there's an interesting background about Pilate and how he ended up in Judea at that particular time. And thirdly, what can we learn uh, from these events so we can be better informed, but also to help us avoid perhaps uh, following or falling into the behavior uh, which Pilate displayed at that particular time? So first of all, who was really pulling the strings? Who was actually in control of the circumstances that both Jesus and Pilate found themselves in? And the answer to this is very clear. And it's, ver it's given very clearly in Matthew's Gospel, in one of the other accounts of Pontius Pilate meeting Jesus in chapter 26, verse 3 of Matthew, it says, Then the chief priests and elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him, but not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people, they said. So the New Testament is very clear in this point. A plan was hatched by the Jewish establishment to kill Jesus. And as you read the accounts uh, which followed this plan, all those involved in helping this group, the religious leaders of the people of uh, the Jews, uh, their, their approach can be viewed, that everyone else involved can be viewed as pawns on a chessboard who were being manipulated to a large extent to carry out the agenda that other people who were hidden in the shadows had actually engaged in. And as it got closer to the end of the plot, the Sanhedrin had to get more involved. The Jewish authorities had no power to impose the death penalty, and that's in the passage uh, which Janet read for us. They said to uh, Pilate, we've no authority to do what we want to achieve. And we read about that, as I said, a few minutes ago. And in John chapter 18, verse 31, Pilate did not want to get involved. Pilate said to the Jewish leaders, Take him yourself and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. Then a bit later, they became even more open and aggressive in what they wanted to achieve. They could no longer hide as much in the shadows. And when Pilate was prevaricating, and unsure about what to do, they then became far more intent in fulfilling their plan. For example, in John 19, verse 8, they said, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the son of God. Of course, Pilate, as the governor representing the Roman Empire, in Judea was in a position to enforce Roman law. He was the only person who could actually obtain the objective, but he was pr 
prevaricating. And the longer it went on, he tried to delay the outcome that those opposed to Jesus actually wanted. In verse 12 of chapter 19, which we read, If you let this man go, they said to Pilate, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. And that was a very uh, pertinent comment they were making to Pilate, as we'll see as we look at the second point about Pontius Pilate's background and why he was actually there at that particular time in his relationship with the Jewish authorities in Rome. Finally, the Jewish religious leaders themselves committed blasphemy under their own law by finally saying to Pilate, in answer to another of Pilate's questions, shall I crucify your king? They responded, or the chief priest answered the question. He said, we have no king but Caesar. So they'd finally come out of the shadows and they got more involved having to publicly accept Caesar as their king. Not only did they reject the Son of God as the king of the Jews, but they publicly acknowledged and accepted Caesar was their king. And we will see shortly why this acceptance would run against everything these people actually believed at the time. They actually hated Caesar. They hated the Romans. But to some extent, Pilate, by design or by accident, got them to make a public admission. And Pilate wanted that admission. And you'll see why, as we go on to the next part uh, in a few minutes, his relationship with the Roman authorities in the Roman Empire was not good. And he would have been delighted for them to have acknowledged that Caesar was their king. Pilate had a running battle with the Jewish people in Judea as he tried to impose on them the Roman culture and he had to get involved from time to time in various riots or public insurrections when he became too heavy-handed in his approach uh, by imposing uh, Roman culture and beliefs, and in particular, Roman beliefs that Caesar was king, and indeed some Caesars claimed to be God. So this was a cultural issue for the Jewish people. I'm not sure this was really Pilate's intention. I think he genuinely wanted to avoid murdering an innocent man. But the Jewish religious leaders very craftily shifted the argument onto an area or into an area which was vitally important to the Roman Empire and therefore to Pilate. They essentially said, Jesus needs to be crucified because he has set himself up in opposition to Caesar and we want you to uphold Roman law by crucifying Jesus because he is carrying out an insurrection against Caesar by claiming to be king. And of course that was a complete lie. The, the Jewish authorities wanted Jesus dead and they were prepared to say anything eventually, even running contrary to what they really believed to achieve their objectives. Another uh, lesson from this is that when those uh, who like to lurk in the shadows manipulating events eventually have to show their true intentions and step out of the shadows to justify their behavior, they use half-truths and propaganda and lies to justify and support 
their objectives. And before we move on to look at Pilate's history and how the Jewish leaders used this to get what they wanted, it is worth mentioning the fact that Judas Iscariot was the first person, those lurking in the shadows with a plan actually seconded to their cause to achieve their objective. And that's why we often associate Judas Iscariot and Pontius Pilate together in what happened. We know from what we read in the New Testament that Judas loved money. And this was his weak spot. And the Jewish leaders started this ball rolling by bribing Judas with 30 pieces of silver. When Judas, full of remorse, wanted to return the bribe which had been given to him by the Jewish ruling council, they refused to accept it. And you can read all about that in Matthew chapter 21, verse 3, for example. When Judas, who betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was full of remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. And Judas is recorded as saying, I have sinned and betrayed innocent blood. And the Jewish religious leaders simply said, what is that to us? That's your responsibility. And we're then told, so Judas threw the money into the temple and left. And very often those who manipulate other people to achieve an objective in the way that these religious leaders had manipulated Judas by bribing him, they then deny all responsibility. And of course, they manipulated, as we'll see, Pontius Pilate as well. So the second point I want us to think about for a short time this morning is to look briefly at Pilate's history with the Jews in Judea to try and understand a bit better why Pilate could be manipulated and made by these Jewish leaders to carry out their agenda. Very often, the Romans allowed a local person of importance perhaps a former ruling family, to basically run an area of the Roman Empire that they had conquered and they wanted to bring more closely under their control. The Romans wanted two main things from people they conquered. They wanted peace and quiet and they wanted obedience to Roman laws, but they also wanted money they wanted to raise tax from the people who, in their mind, from their perspective, sitting in Rome, looking out over their empire, they're thinking, all these people have been conquered. How do we fund all this? And they wanted peace and quiet, and they wanted to collect tax. And that caused a lot of trouble in Jerusalem amongst the Jewish people. So Pontius Pilate was appointed by Tiberius Caesar in AD 27 to Judea because historically the Jews, from the Roman perspective, had been a rebellious and a very difficult group to control. Pilate's appointment would not have been a highly sought after appointment. I suppose a worse appointment would have been sent to the north of England to face the Scots on Hadrian's Wall. But I can assure you that being sent to Judea by Tiberius Caesar was not a top job. It was not a job that politicians were looking to take on. And you'll know, of course, in uh, modern times, countries like the United States, uh, presidents in recent years have been able to pass on ambassadorships to their best supporters and they send them 
to the best places. They send them to places like Paris or London to be the ambassador. Unfortunately, the fact that Pilate had been sent uh, to Judea amongst the Jews was probably a sign about how lowly he was regarded by the Roman authorities at the center of the empire. It was near the bottom of the Roman Empire's political ladder. Indeed, being sent to Judea may have been a not so subtle message that your career is on a downward trajectory. Indeed, it may not have any further down to go. This is your last posting, and you better get it right. Judea was notorious for being chaotic and ungovernable. Before Pilate had to deal with Jesus and a possible riot or insurrection, he was already on thin ice with Tiberius Caesar. The fact he was in Judea, of course, as I've said, was a bad start, and the fact he was pretty useless at his job of keeping the peace made it even worse, and the Jews, the religious leaders of the Jewish people, knew all about this. There's a book written by uh, an author called Paul Mayer, and it's a book about the life of Pontius Pilate. This is a book of historical fiction, but it covers many of the facts about Pontius Pilate's time as governor of Judea. A few years before the trial of Jesus, Pilate had caused an uproar in Jerusalem by having his Roman troops march into Jerusalem displaying their flags, and he had the flags displayed in the Jewish temple. And of course, this went down very badly and caused a major riot. It was a provocation. He knew it was a provocation. Why he did it, nobody knows. Maybe he just wanted to rub their noses in the fact that he controlled Judea. Secondly, the quality of water in Jerusalem was very poor. So Pilate built at great expense an aqueduct to carry water, fresh water from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. And you may be thinking, well, what can go wrong? This can only be a good thing, but not when Pilate's involved. Pilate funded this expensive and grandiose project by stealing money from the Jewish temple treasury. And when this was discovered, this led to another riot and several Jews were killed by Roman soldiers as a result. So word of this behavior had also reached Caesar Tiberius. And he was not impressed by his third rate governor in one of his minor provinces provinces on the edge of his empire. Pilate had received a message that he was skating on thin ice. Five months before what we now call Good Friday, Pilate, in fact, had received a letter from uh, Rome, from the headquarters, from Tiberius Caesar, and it said, Stop provoking the Jews, or you will be removed and brought back to Rome, and the end result will not be a good one for you. So this is why when the Jewish leaders said to Pilate in John chapter 19, verses 12 to 16, if you let this man live, you are not a friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. On hearing this, Pilate knew exactly that the Jewish leaders had pinned him into a corner. He knew that if he did not give them what they wanted, which was the death of Jesus, there would be another riot and his career would almost certainly be over 
and he himself was likely to then to be severely dealt with on his return to Rome. Pilate knew this was a put-up job by the Jewish religious leaders. He knew because he wasn't a stupid man. You don't get into these positions by being completely incompetent. He wasn't the best, but he knew what was going on. And he knew there were no grounds for killing Jesus. But he had been outplayed politically by the powers in Jerusalem. He tried another ploy to distract the Jewish leaders, or more importantly, to distract the crowd. He offered to release uh, Jesus instead of Barabbas. But Pilate did not understand or he could not accept the fact the Jewish religious leaders had chosen the crowd who came to the feast. This crowd was certainly not the same crowd lining the streets when Jesus entered Jerusalem a few days er earlier. This was a rabble of malcontents. After all, it would attract people who had an interest in the people who had been imprisoned who were up for release. So this was prearranged theatre. The last thing Pilate needed was another insurrection with criminals and friends of Barabbas surrected by the Jewish religious leaders. Pilate realised that he had been outplayed. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, we are told, and an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. And he probably washed his hands and made a statement that he did not accept responsibility because he really knew, of course, what was going on in the background. Pilate's behavior was not in any way honorable. It was self-serving. He was merely distancing himself from events. Pilate had made clear his lack of a moral compass. When he spoke to Jesus, as recorded in chapter 18, verse 38, Jesus said to Pilate, I've come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And if you don't remember anything else from this message this morning, remember that verse from John chapter 18. Jesus said, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And we're then told that Pilate said, what is truth? And we're just going to look at that a little bit in closing. So thirdly, what can we learn about these events and the behavior of Pilate and the involvement of all the other people in that particular scene? Although Pilate is possibly to be commended for his attempts to oppose the Jewish religious leaders and the crowd that they had gathered around them, ultimately Pilate was a weak leader, and he was partly motivated by self-preservation due to his bad history with Tiberius Caesar, but he ultimately failed to act justly to save his own skin. Pilate, as we've just noted, said, what is truth? And Jesus, of course, had said uh, elsewhere, I am the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate, like many people, had a defective moral compass. His lack of a functioning good moral compass was his fundamental defect. This is almost always the fundamental defect when people make bad decisions. 
people generally know the right thing to do. And we often uh, look around us in the political context and we see politicians in the, the public gaze making bad decisions and you think, how could they possibly have made that decision? Well, the fact they're in the public gaze puts them under scrutiny. But human beings generally often make bad decisions because their moral compass is a little bit off and sometimes other uh, motivations interfere in their decision-making process in the way they did with Pilate. What we need to do is to keep in mind the words of Jesus to Pilate. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. The trouble in our modern age is that very few people are listening to Jesus' moral or ethical teaching. And they are certainly not listening to or not obeying the basic commandments, do not kill, do not lie. They're ignoring, ignoring basic teaching accepted for centuries. And when Pilate said, what is truth? 2,000 years ago, you will basically find in our modern society, many people saying, well, what is truth? Rather than accepting what their conscience tells them about what is truth and what is right and wrong, let alone what God has already revealed as truth and what is right and wrong. We're living in a post-truth world or society. We now live in a culture in which people ignore facts and they say that false falsehoods are their truth. They talk about my truth rather than the truth. Pontius Pilate was an adherent to this philosophy almost 2,000 years ago. It's nothing particularly new when we see it in our modern society. And it's when he said dismissively, what is truth? We really understand Pilate's character. He made bad decisions as governor of Judea. He had a defective moral character because he didn't actually believe anything of importance to guide and direct him. And once God's law and Jesus' teaching are ignored and truth becomes a matter of opinion, then we will see people making bad choices. And not only will we see individuals making bad choices, but when societies and governments move away from these principles, you'll also see them making poor choices. And regrettably, many people who are the weakest in society will suffer the consequences of these decisions. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 44, talking about the Jewish people who were opposing him, he said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. And Jesus, of course, knowing that he was going to be crucified, said to them, talking about the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. For Pilate, truth was a relative thing, open to debate. It was a matter of opinion, not fact. For Jesus, truth was an absolute. It wasn't a matter of opinion. It was a question of fact. And we need to make sure we do not get caught up in the modern approach 
that truth is something relative. We are now seeing ridiculous arguments made where facts are ignored and people's opinions about certain aspects of life and society are considered as facts and laws are now being passed to make it a crime to dispute different or false opinions. And one example I'll give, which is one of many, but I was reading in the newspaper a few weeks ago about a young lady uh, who suffered from uh, anorexia and her parents wanted her to receive treatment. But the medical authorities in the UK went to court in order to allow her to take her own life. And that's the sort of thing where the boundaries about truth do not kill, for example, are being pushed to extremes. And as believers who believe in Jesus' teaching and believe that truth is something right or wrong and not a matter of opinion, it's very important for us to be aware of all these things that are going on around us. We often almost always know what's right and wrong, not just because God says it in his word, but because God has also given us a conscience. And our conscience, together with the teaching in the Bible, makes it very clear to us how God wants people to live, how he wants us to behave, what he wants us to believe about certain fundamental things. Someone who was appointed, Pilate, who was appointed to govern and uphold the law, allowed an innocent man to be killed. And we, as Christians, are in a real ethical and moral battle to preserve God's law in our society and in our day. Our governments and political leaders would often not know the actual truth when they're dealing with things. And it's important for the church and for Christians not to be conformed to the world, not to be like society, but to stand and oppose anything that's clearly a falsehood. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we thank you for this time this morning. We um, pray you'll be with Reverend Myers as he travels and keep him safe. And Lord, we pray that you would bless our time this morning and this message uh, for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our prayer of intercession today. Dear Lord, we come to you with our prayer of concern and intercession, where we're praying for others. Today, we know you're a God that hears every plea and cry that we make, and not only hears them, but responds to them. Today, we pray for those that are bereaved, that are saddened by the loss of a loved one. We pray for those who are sick, and we've specifically been asked to pray for Emily Barker's mother, Miss Karma Ashton. She's ill and needs your healing. We pray for those who have been on our sick list that we've been mentioning over the last couple months. We also know there's many that we know of who need our prayers that we haven't listed on the list, but we reach out and pray for them at this time. We know you're the great physician and more than capable of providing healing. But that's not always the way things go. But we pray that whatever happens, it will be your will to your honor and glory. But if healing is your way, we thank you in advance. We pray for those around the world who are experiencing difficulties, facing difficult times, difficult decisions. 
we help you to, we ask you to help them make a wise decision and a decision that would mean following your advice. We pray for those who are facing violence, wars and aggression. We know there's conflicts around the world and people are being mistreated and exploited and abused. We pray for the safety and the security of all those. We pray for our minister as he travels. We pray for the needs of all who aren't mentioned here today and the specific needs that are in each and every one of our hearts. We lift these up to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is going to be number 640, The Church's One Foundation. Father, as we bring our offerings, we ask your blessings on them. We ask you to multiply them and ensure that those who have stewardship use them to your honor and glory. Give them the wisdom and discernment to use them to the best of their abilities. And now, as we bring our service to close, we pray that we will go forth this week and every day 
with peace in our heart, with love for all others. In the name of God, our Father, Jesus, his only begotten Son, and our Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit, our constant companion until his second coming. In his name, amen. Thank you.